graphics designer. Uh, and today I would like to share my views on the design in the enterprise software. So why would like a design matters even inside a grid? It's not about table, grid and all. Basically, I would like to share my views. Uh, you know, in the enterprise software, how people will treat the design in the you know legacy system. So. I would like to address some of the misconceptions, you know, where we have in enterprise software with some real world examples and uh, I would like to prove that those are like a myth, those are not, uh, you know, those are like misconceptions, you know, somehow actually uh, design become uh, in different way actually, maybe what design was is what design is now is completely different, but still legacy people, legacy enterprise systems are still treating in that way. So I would like to, you know, address those other stuff. And I'd like to share my views how to incorporate design thinking in the enterprise software legacy systems. So we'll start that. Yes, opinions. I mean, when we say misconception, basically, when the opinion is wrong, we'll say like, you know, it's a myth, right? So let's see the, you know, some of most common misconceptions. So this is the very most common. We obviously, we, you know, every time we used to hear about this, like enterprise products doesn't require a good design. You know, they are experts. Uh, you know, they know how to handle the product. They they really, you know, well trained. Will give training and will give everything. So they don't care about how design intuitive you you came up with. This okay, they can manage and they can deal with the things, right? So most common opinion, right? So let's see how it's going to, you know, going to be a misconception. If you able to, you know, relate these two images, one of these is enterprise product and the other one is a consumer product. So why is like an enterprise a big ferry? You know, it's got so much of stuff and it's dealing with many people. So we can relate as an enterprise big product and even size of the product, I mean size of the thing, everything. There's a small board, I mean consumer board, so an individual can handle that. So if you relate that, let's see some observations on the on these images. Sorry. This is the size of the risk. If you see all this water is a risk. If something goes wrong, the ferry, the chances are very less to survive. But the amount of the risk for consumer product is very minimal. So if something goes wrong, the wonderful lady, she still can survive. So maybe, you know, it can something wrong, but actually still she can survive. So the amount of the risk is uncomparable when you look at this enterprise and the consumer product. Features. Here you got many features, you know, and after we are like, you know, when you have more features on a product, that's more complex because you know, when you have more features, you need to address carefully, you need to intentionally design each and everything, otherwise it, it's going to be a mess and it's going to be more complex. But they're actually easy to handle. There is no features, only one thing actually, she can handle with the hand. So this is also a comparison. It's an organization, you know. There is an organization, so it's a company. This also impacts the mental model of the person who actually using the product. Uh, but that is an individual. So, you know, when there is a situation, you have to take some decisions. This organization individual thing really impacts a lot. So you can take an individual, you can take decisions just like that. But obviously, you have a you know status quo, you have a process, you have a kind of hierarchy that you have to follow to get anything done. So that's also an impact. That's also a differentiation. Group operating and uh, self-operating. So obviously, you know, it can be an operated by more than one, and this can be operated by just one. So this also, an, you know, differentiation. So when you look at this graph, the risk, features, and complexity is completely different when it comes to an enterprise and a consumer product. So we have more risk when something goes wrong, and things crash and uh, you know futures and futures means complexity though the amount of the risk is very high so my point is enterprise product enterprise products require great design and nice approach it's not something like they're experts they can handle they can handle their experts but still the amount of the risk the, the futures the complexity is very high so they definitely need a nice touch or a great you know approach in terms of design of the product Second one, uh, when all that I'm showing numbers, I'm dealing with numbers. So what is the place for design? I mean, what do you do with numbers, man? We saw lots of tables, enterprise legacy, it's all numbers, tables, data, everywhere data. I mean, what I can do with the data? 
It's also common opinion in the enterprise. Let me try. This is a number, just 10 digit number. It's a just a number. So what it is, I mean exactly we don't have any clue there. So what it, it could be anything. Let's say some possibilities. It could be any one of it. It could be a transaction, an account number, a phone number, a number of logins, number of downloads, a bill number, a reference number. It could be anything. But we don't know exactly what it is. But if you make this thing like this, if you design the 10 digit number like this, there is a possibility it could be a phone number. We can't say it's the only phone number, but there is a possibility of kind of giving a information to the user like it could be a phone number. But this is not the only way to design. So the 10 digit number can be designed in these many ways plus the 24 5 other. So how do we know, like, you know, in which way we have to design? So we got 10 digit number, we try to, you know, give the space in between that. So there are many ways to design. So how to find the exact one? How to find the right one? A meaningful design, I mean, a meaningful framing is what design. It's not just to differentiate, you can't do anything you want. There should have some meaning to that. So what are we doing? What are we designing? If there is a meaning to that, then all it's, Adds a, it adds some value to the product. So meaningful framing is not designed, just not to differentiate the original one. So that's my point. Uh, I don't know how it's going to play here, but I have a reference. He's a Google designer, but he'll say something. Because I'll, t I'll tell people, I work at Google. And now, what do you work on? I design search. And they, they kind of pause for a second. And they're like, what is there to design? Design is a balance between a number of things, the utility, the usability, uh, and the beauty. I think you kind of require those three ingredients. One of the first things that I did when I joined the search team was that I said that search was too slow. The response was, uh, well, we, we probably have to change the speed of light in order to solve this problem. And I said, no, I, I think it could be faster. The box in which you type, it was the default size that input boxes are in the browser. And so for like a decade, that's what it was. This is the way in which people are talking to Google. They're doing it through this tiny little box. I said, well, why don't we make that bigger? It was a very simple design change. We just made the input box larger. Commensurately, the, the font size got larger and auto completions gets larger. And people started noticing it more. By noticing it more, they actually started using it more. They were actually able to get to the answer they wanted faster just by tweaking the size of this box. There's lots of things that look very small that you might not notice that we change to make the experience better. Over time, it actually really adds up. I still think it's too slow. That's why we're investing so heavily in the voice experience. This is a different thing, but basically, you know, you can see the difference. Just you change the you know, size of the text box, that actually impacts a lot. So, go back to this. So sometimes those small changes also will impact a lot. Maybe we can't see, you know, and we can't identify it unless we really experience the thing. Uh, you know, we are experiencing uh, you know, a particular change. So it makes, you know, it makes a very big difference. This is uh, Hans Rosley. He is a Swedish guy. He is a professor and doctor. So part of his job, uh, he was as a professor, right? So he was trying to explain this large amount of data to his students. So he got like an information about 200 countries, around 200 years, and about different of one like 20,000 you know, information, magic. So he wants to explain to the students how actually world was, you know, is changing from suppose, you know, from 18 to 1900 to like, you know, this thing. It's a very tough task, you know, if you go by Excel sheets or any other way, you know, the, you won't get any value. So end of the day, when we actually enterprise companies or products, you know, when we data science and all these machine learning things will help to add some value to the, because actually it will, it will, it will help us to take some decisions. But when you're not seeing the data in that way, how do you make the decision? So you cannot go with Excel sheet or any other format. So he came up with a tool called Gapminder. So Gapminder basically does the same information 
you know, we'll present the same information in a different way. And uh, let's see that. Visualization is right at the heart of my own work too. I teach global health. And I know having the data is not enough. I have to show it in ways people both enjoy and understand. Now, I'm going to try something I've never done before. Animating the data in real space with a bit of technical assistance from the crew. So, here we go. First, an axis for health. Life expectancy from 25 years to 75 years. And down here, an axis for wealth, income per person, 400, 4,000, and 40,000 dollars. So down here is poor and sick, and up here is rich and healthy. Now, I'm going to show you the world 200 years ago, in 1810. Here come all the countries. Europe brown, Asia red, Middle East green, Africa south of Sahara blue, and the Americas yellow. And the size of the country bubble showed the size of the population. And in 1810, it was pretty crowded down there, wasn't it? All countries were sick and poor. Life expectancy were below 40 in all countries. And only the UK and the Netherlands were slightly better off, but not much. And now, why start the world? <coughs> The Industrial Revolution makes countries in Europe and elsewhere move away from the rest. But the colonized countries in Asia and Africa, they are stuck down there. And eventually, the Western countries get healthier and healthier. And now, we slow down to show the impact of the First World War and the Spanish flu epidemic. What a catastrophe! And now I speed up through the 1920s and the 1930s. And in spite of the Great Depression, Western countries forge on towards greater wealth and health. Japan and some others try to follow, but most countries stay down here. Now, after the tragedies of the Second World War, we stop a bit to look at the world in 1948. 1948 was a great year. The war was over. Sweden topped the medal table at the Winter Olympics, and I was born. But the differences between the countries of the world was wider than ever. The United States was in the front, Japan was catching up, Brazil was way behind, Iran was getting a little richer from oil, but still had short lives. And the Asian giants, China, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh and Indonesia, they were still poor and sick down here. But look what is about to happen. Here we go again. In my lifetime, former colonies gained independence and then finally they started to get healthier and healthier and healthier. And in the 1970s, then countries in Asia and Latin America started to catch up with the Western countries. They became the emerging economies. Some in Africa follows. Some Africans were stuck in civil war and others hit by HIV. And now we can see the world today in the most up-to-date statistics. Most people today live in the middle, but there are huge differences at the same time between the best of countries and the worst of countries. And there are also huge inequalities within countries. These bubbles show country averages, but I can split them. Take China, I can split it into provinces. There goes Shanghai. It has the same wealth and health as Italy today. And there is the poor inland province Guizhou. It is like Pakistan. And if I split it further, the rural parts are like Ghana in Africa. And yet, despite the enormous disparities today, we have seen 200 years of remarkable progress. That huge historical gap between the West and the rest is now closing. We have become an entirely new converging world. And I see a clear trend into the future with aid, trade, green technology and peace. It's fully possible that everyone can make it to the healthy, wealthy corner. Well, what you just seen in the last few minutes is a story of 200 countries shown over 200 years and beyond. It involved plotting of 120,000 numbers. Pretty neat, huh? Continue, right? And uh, I mean, because of this, actually, is able to explain as a story. I mean, so when you look at the same data in this way, you'll have lots of value. I mean, you, you make some decisions. I mean, because of 
uh, you know, what happening, even history or current, whatever you want to see, you will definitely add some value when actually you present the data in this way, rather actually showing, you know, showing in another format. So, uh, yeah, so my point is data and information are not boring. So it matters how you bring the data alive, what is the meaning you're going to add and what is the value you're going to give. So, it's about numbers. And this is the one, design takes lots of time and money. You know, our product is running, up and running and we can't spend design now. And it takes huge amount of time and money, our deadlines are very tight, we can't do that, right? I mean, this is also a typical, you know, a common actually opinion, but it's a misconception, let's see that. If you consider this, it's a, it's a very high level typical software development plan. I mean, uh, so at high level you'll have two sections. One part is about planning and one part is about implementation. So in the planning you may have this requirements gathering, defined scope of work and prioritizing and few other stuff. But the other side, you'll have a design phase, definitely start with design and development, testing and some bulk fixing and releases. Just assume this is a typical software model. And your current model is something like this. If the current model is like you're giving a four weeks of time of two people of designers, and you are allowing to, you are allowing them to do some visual and interaction design like two weeks, two weeks. If this is your current model, okay. And what I'm proposing is put one guy out of two in the planning time and give a one week of time. So you'll say the same one week of time in the implementation time because actually by the time they'll get a better clarity on that. So in the interaction part, they don't need two weeks. They can done in one week. So you're not you're not losing any time, you're not losing any money, you're not adding any new people at all. So it's just like you know change, changing the way of you know, thinking about design and giving a place in time of planning. So not directly in the implementation time. So a little place in the time of planning will help to meet the deadlines. Fourth one, okay, we did the design assessment you know, somewhere in last, last year or something. Our customers are happy, we don't have any compliance, our product is okay. I mean, why we need a design you know, kind of thing now? I mean, they are okay, I mean, everything is going good, our revenues are okay, everything is okay, right? So why we need to do the, why we need to think of it? It's corner model. Noria Kikano uh, is a professor and basically built this model for some financial calculations but somehow most of the product companies are using this model. So basically what he's trying to say is every product will have a three, you know, will have futures, right? You know, every product will have futures, you know, 10 futures, 100 futures, you know, you'll have futures every product. So if you divide the futures in different, you see the futures in different ways, out of the future, some of them like a basic needs and some of them we can consider as delightful and some of them like, you know, performance needs. So his point is, if you don't meet your basic needs of the product, your, your customer will, dis, uh, will disconnect and dissatisfied and he will frustrated and he'll stop using the product. So every product, uh, all the features, whatever they got, they, have, they must meet the basic needs of the particular product. So that's what's it. And he was saying like, you know, over the time, delightful innovations, what are we saying, will become basic needs. Like, you know, having a, you know, like an example, having a car 10 years back in India, maybe could be luxury for somebody. But now it's almost like becoming basic. So, like everything. So, so over the time, things will change. People, mental models will change. So based on that, actually, design implementation should be happening. You know, it's periodical. It's not something we done and we shift and, you know, we, you can't see design like that. Another example is Gmail in 2007. It's looking like this. And uh, in 2010, it's looking like this. 2012, this. 2014, it is. So design is not static, it evolves with time. So you need to make sure like, you know, you need to periodically check your design whether it's, whether it's addressing your targeted users, mental models, whether your persona is exactly supporting your product or your persona has got updated, your persona is like, you know, their behaviors got changed, their expectation got changed, then actually your product is also should be 
match with their expectations and the behavior. So you have to make that design as a periodical thing. It's not a one-time job. So that's my point. This is cool. Okay, all this cool. I mean, that's, those are like misconceptions I would like to address. Now everything is cool, but how to make this happen? I know this, that's a, you know, for legacy companies, it's a big challenge. You know, how to make this happen? Uh, so I'll share my views. I mean, not my views. What expert says, let's see what this is. We must unlearn what we learn. So, it was before in 15th century, before Copernicus and Galileo, uh, the world is believing like, you know, earth is in the middle and sun is in the other way. Okay, so, uh, but once Copernicus and Galileo like... Sorry. Yeah, once Copernicus and Galileo, we understood like, you know, that's not true boss. Actually, earth is in the other side and sun is in the middle. Okay, so at the moment actually we have, we unlearned what we learned, so. And then we thought like, you know, we have, we are one universe, one Milky Way, one galaxy, right? And then actually once satellite is goes up, we realize like, you know, we are multiverse. We are not just one universe, one Milky Way, there are multi, you know, millions of Milky Ways. So it's not just one universe. So at that time also, we unlearned completely what we learned. And now we got this Kepler 186F. So NASA recently formed a clay planet. It's most habitual job. So, there's a hope, like, you know, this is also, like, you know, we unlearned. We thought, like, you know, we are the only, uh, you know, species on the planet, of course on the planet, on the universe and all, <laughs> but actually that's not true. So, there is a chance of, there could be some life, you know, other side of the, other side of the planet. So, design is not just about buttons and images, icons, whatever. It's far beyond that, it's basically behavior of your product. So, how you, how your product is behaving, will be defined with only design. So, so that is one thing actually we must have learned. All these legacy enterprise software companies treats design something like this. So they should, we all must unlearn that and we should understand it's a behavior. Design is a behavior, it's not just thing. Let's complete the picture, the second uh, solution. Uh, suppose, you know, we have different phases in software, like, you know, a time of discovery, there is time of design, there is time of design, testing, basically. So, if suppose that is the scope of the, you know, potential for design, but this is what actually we are doing. This is what most of the companies are doing. They are actually doing off big things. They are just, just doing, you know, off of the wall. So, they are not filling the gap. They are putting the, you know, complete effort, uh, as per at least uh, proposed, uh, scope. So when we complete the things, things will look better. So we need to put efforts uh, in terms of discovery time, in terms of design time, in terms of testing time. Design needs to be completely, I know, this should work out. Otherwise, you cannot actually do, you know, do something like on uh, bigger things. Otherwise, the result won't be good. Third one, design is not a differentiator. I mean, it's a little bit, uh, you know, awkward maybe. People think like design is differentiator. So, and enterprise companies is also most of the enterprise legacy systems. And they now thinking about design because they found design is a differentiator. Their competence already, you know, a, a, you know, a many years up ahead in terms of design, and they found maybe the clients are not liking their design. So now actually because of the you know dub gap, people are adopting design. But that is not true. That cannot happen there. See this, I mean, the Apple store idea copied by hmm? Samsung, similar to Apple Show. Thomson Cook, Microsoft, Radio Share, and even Starbucks. Starbucks is also, uh, I mean, the only dates in San Francisco, I guess. So they're kind of uh, giving an ambience like an Apple Store ambience. So it's not a differentiation factor, in my view, it's a foundation factor. You need to understand the design from the foundation level, in the foundation level. Then only it happens. If you just adopt the design just because of it's a differentiator, or, or confidence are running ahead, you know, they're getting, you know, big bucks and all, we're using the clients. If you, if you treat design like that, it will be something like that, you know, Google Store and uh, Microsoft Store. It won't be like an Apple Store. So, it should be like a foundation. You should really understand 
the importance of the design, you should have the design thinking and if you shift it, you have to keep that in the foundation rather doing it at the end of the day. That's all. Thank you.